So, well, maybe just to a, a gentle reminder of the of the rules. We have 30 minutes for for the presentation, 15 minutes for the discussions, and 15 minutes for the Q and A. And the first paper is uh, going to be presented by Karel Mertens about uh, uh, working from home. Uh, that uh, is a really topical issue. Uh, that at least here at the bank is generating uh, endless and um, um, passionate debates. So, uh, Karel, you have uh, our full attention. Uh, thank you. Me to present this paper. So this paper is joint work um, with Adam Blandin and Alex Alexander Bick. Um, and the usual disclaimer uh, applies, uh, given that I work and, and Alex too at, at a Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, these are our views. So the sort of the origin of this paper is really, uh, as I'm sure was the case here as well, that in policy institutions, early on in the pandemic, we were really looking for uh, real-time information uh, on what was going on in the economy. And so one of several initiatives that we, take, that we took was to essentially um, field our own version of the CPS survey, uh, labor market survey, um, online um, to get a sort of a real-time and more frequent reading on, on the unemployment uh, situation. Um, so we started this in March of 2020, uh, almost immediately after the pandemic started. And after a couple of weeks, as it became clear that <laughs> this pandemic was going to last longer than a couple of weeks, we started asking questions about, um, um, uh, about working from home. And so today I'm going to present some of the findings um, based, based on, on those questions. If you're interested, uh, so all the micro data is publicly available online and it's, and it's free to use for, for everyone. And it's US, US data, of course. So, so what did we find? So not surprisingly, there was a huge surge in working from home uh, because of the pandemic. Because our survey includes retrospective <laughs> questions about how frequently people were working from home before the pandemic. So we can sort of uh, measure the change during the pandemic. And so whereas in our survey, about one out of seven workdays was done fully from home, that rose dramatically in May. Uh, which is the first month in which we started asking these questions, to around 40%. <coughs> and then uh, sort of our main focus in this paper is going to be uh, on the fact that this surge in work from home was actually quite persistent. So the last one of our survey was <coughs> June 21. And at that stage, still 29% of all workdays was done completely uh, from home. Um, if, if you look at who change their working habits. Uh, unsurprisingly, it's largely a story of, of highly educated, high income people. And it's primarily people who are in stable jobs, they didn't change employers. And, and, um, and they used to commute daily uh, before the pandemic. So as I said, our main focus in the paper is really in trying to understand why was this rise in work from home so persistent? Because you can argue in mid 21, at least in the US, uh, basically everyone who was gonna get vaccinated at that point got at least the first dose. And so you could argue that the health risks had already diminished quite a bit. And so our story in this paper is really about uh, two different types of reasons uh, for why work from home um, may have been that persistent. So on the one hand, of course, it could be the pandemic was still going on and sort of the, the health risks of being on site and on the job were arguably still elevated. And so it could just be um, that that was still reflected in workers' decisions to, to, to stay at home. Um, but, but what we're going to argue in this paper is really that most of that uh, increase in work from home beyond the first couple of months was really about uh, something else, uh, just a, a dramatic change in, in the work arrangements of, of workers, mainly that a lot of workers weren't allowed to work from home before the pandemic and that dramatically changed. And once given the option, um, a lot of workers decided um, to stay working from home um, <clears throat> much more frequently. So this is, our, our story is essentially that a lot of that increase was about adoption of new work arrangement. 
And that's important because if it's mostly about adoption, so we argue that you can expect this rising work from home to be fairly persistent. And so what we do is we develop a quantitative model uh, to, to de-quantify the sort of the relative importance of these two explanations. And then we do a counterfactual in which we lower the costs of working on site to basically levels before the pandemic, but we keep the fraction of workers that has the, the access to the option to work from home sort of the same as in mid-21. And then we ask the question, so uh, if everything else returns back to normal, um, how many people would continue to work from home? And the answer we get is that the relative to before the pandemic, um, the, 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 the share of people who would be working from home all the time would roughly double from seven and a half to 14.6%. And in terms of share of work days, whereas before it was one out of seven work days from home, um, our prediction is that after, you know, more, more in the long run, that would settle at uh, one in every five work days. So we do a couple of validation exercises for these quantitative prediction. One is that in our survey, we ask about workers own expectations for work from home in the long run. And as I will show you, that roughly gives similar numbers as the model prediction. And then, and this is not in the paper, but we've run a couple of follow-up surveys in 22, um, sort of also showing that the rate at which people are working from home is, is roughly consistent with what, what we were predicting in the model. Okay, so let me begin by first giving a little bit more background about the survey itself. Um, so it's an online survey. As I said, we started in March 2020. So in total, we have about 73,000 observations, although, although in the first couple of waves of the survey, we didn't ask about work from home. So in, 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 in practice, we have about 66,000 uh, observations um, running from May 2020 to June 21. A key aspect of our survey, and I think this is really important for anyone who sort of tries to measure uh, any aggregate quantity using these online surveys is that the bulk of our survey consists, really replicates the, the current population survey. Um, so that has a number of, uh, I think, important advantages. So one is that when we talk about work and employment, it follows the exact same definition that we are used to in, in sort of the official data. Um, the other one is that, you know, when you do an online survey, the results are in no way representative of the US population. Uh, but because we have a rich set of information um, uh, that is essentially identical to the CPS, we can change the sample weights to match uh, those in, in the CPS. And that turns out to be very, very important uh, in order to make sort of the answers you're getting um, as representative as, as possible. And whatever sampling error there's gonna be, at least it's gonna be similar to the sampling error that is there in the CPS. The advantage, of course, is when you do something like this, you could add questions that are not in the CPS. And today I'm gonna leverage sort of retrospective questions about February 2020, the month right before the pandemic, and then a bunch of questions on commuting behavior. Um, so we use Qualtrics for this survey. Um, so I'm not gonna say too much about it, other than it's a really low cost way to do things like this. And you can tell Qualtrics to target certain um, um, demographic characteristics. But one thing that we learned very early on is that you're not gonna get a representative sample. You wanna be very careful when you do surveys like, like, like this. And so constructing these sample weights and matching the CPS is, is extremely important. If you're ever interested in doing something like this yourself, my co-authors have sort of a cookbook paper where they, you know, present the template and, and explain how to do all of this uh, yourself. Okay, so another important aspect about work from home is uh, how you ask this a question in a survey. Um, and depending on how you ask that question, you can get very different answers. And for those of you familiar with some, some other estimates of uh, the frequency of working from home, our numbers are we say considerably lower than some others that are out there. And I think that has, besides issues with the sampling representativeness, that has a lot to do with how you ask that question. So here's how we do it. 
So we first ask how many days did you work for this job? Where again, work is defined as in the CPS. And then the follow-up question is how many days did you commute? And then the, the, the survey respondents, they have this option, they have a slider uh, where they can uh, give a, a number between zero and seven uh, for each of these questions. And so we classify then workers into three categories. Um, those that only commute, so the days um, commuted equal the days worked. There's some that work on some days, but commute on others. And then there's workers who uh, say they didn't commute uh, on any work day. Um, so this is a much, this is a broader concept than telework because it includes people, you know, who may be self-employed, have a business at home. We would capture, be capturing those. Um, it's going to exclude home production. You know, many people say, when you ask that you work from home, they might say yes, because what work means might, mean, might, might be much broader than what we usually have in mind. Um, and so we think this is a pretty good way for, for measuring work from home. Um, what is shown here are two um, other measures of work from home from two other surveys that allow us to sort of uh, go back further in time. One is from the American Time Use Survey. Um, it's, this is a basically share of work is work from home. And the other one is from the American Community Survey, uh, which, who, which asks uh, uh, workers w whether they usually work from home. So again, the questions are kind of different. But nevertheless, when we look at the answers to our retrospective questions for 2020, uh, we sort of got, um, uh, I think, answers that are pretty, pretty pretty close to, to those surveys for, from earlier years. Uh, one thing about uh, this graph is that you can see that there was already a, a very gradual upward trend in working from home in the United States. Um, and so sort of what we're going to argue is that there was a level shift in the trend because of the pandemic. OK, so as I, so bef so Looking at the retrospective question, so we find 7.5% of workers say they were fully work from home, 79.5% work from home on some work days, 75% were commuting uh, all the time. So in May of 2020, um, not surprisingly, the number of full-time commuters decreased quite a bit. It sort of uh, recovered. Um, uh, for the rest of 2020 until the winter surge, where it went down a little bit, and then as the vaccination started uh, rolling out, there was some 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 increase. But the key is that uh, sort of the the fraction of daily commuters is still way below what it was uh, right before the pandemic. So if you look at uh, what happened, of course, most people switched to fu fully working from home, and the share of people who worked. Did some work from home actually, actually decreased relative to before the pandemic, and the share of part-time work from home sort of recovered to levels um, seen in, in February 2020. But it's really the full-time work from home component that stayed persistently high. Just a quick uh, you know, validation exercise. So there's other ways in which you can uh, try to measure uh, work from home. Uh, uh, you know without using a survey. So here I'm plotting um, um, a measure based uh, on sort of cell phone geolocation data, which is just counts of, of, of the number of workplace visits um, that are being tracked by, by Google Maps. So big collapse, of course, and then a fairly swift recovery, but then a persistently lower number of commuting trips. Um, because we can count the number of commuting trips in our survey as well, we can sort of compare um, to these, these measures. You can see that our survey measure lines up actually uh, pretty closely with the data that comes from a completely different source. So that gives us confidence that, you know, with that, that, uh, that our sample is sort of uh, hopefully representative of the US population. Now, of course, when you use geolocation data, you don't know why commuting decreased. It could be, of course, a big chunk of that is simply because a lot of people didn't we're not employed anymore. So when you do this decomposition at the end of our sample, so in June 21, uh, we find that 75% of the, the, the decrease in commuting volume 
is actually because of, of people working from home. And the remainder is due to the fact that employment and the length of the work week was still below pre-pandemic levels. Um, <clears throat> we talked about this yesterday as well, and this is not gonna come as a surprise. Um, this was incredibly heterogeneous. Um, different workers were able to switch to working from home at very different rates. So highly educated, high income people, uh, white and, and more women and older workers as well. That kind of evolved uh, through the pandemic. So this is May 2020 early on. Uh, later on in the pandemic, it's still highly educated, high income people. Um, but things like, you know, whether you had children or not started to matter uh, a lot more uh, than, than, uh, than um, in, in the initial months. Um, mainly, if you have children, you became less likely to be working from home. And as I will show you later on, if you ask workers' expectations about working from home, having children uh, makes you much less likely to, to stay from home. Okay, so some of you may be familiar with, uh, so, so Dingle and Nyman have these measures where they go occupation by occupation, can this job be done from home? So this is a scatter plot between, so I, we, I show it here by industry, of sort of the rate of potential work from home versus the rate of actual work from home. And on the left here, I'm showing a scatter plot uh, for February 2020. And there's actually basically no relationship between the potential work from home um, and, and the people that were actually working from home before the pandemic. Um, so, you know, there's some papers that use whether you were working from home before the pandemic as an instrument, not a good idea according to our data. Um, okay, so uh, during the pandemic, and this is mislabeled, this should be May 2020, so in the early months of the pandemic, basically the relationship becomes, becomes very, very strong. Anyone who could work from home more or less was working from home earlier on. But that changed uh, then later on in the pandemic, where there's still a clear relationship with work from home ability, but you definitely have some sectors that kind of switched back um, to um, 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 working on site, and in particular in education. So, so this is kind of a sector where if you have to, we can do it from home, but it doesn't really work very well. And as soon as you get sort of the health situation normalizes, that's a sector in which most workers switched back. Is that uh, working from home only? Uh, yeah, this is working from home only, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> if you just think about how low work from home rates were before the pandemic, it almost, I mean, it has to be the case that the rise is mostly because of people who used to commute daily. And that's what, what these transition rates here um, um, are showing. Um, one interesting fact I want to point out is that so on the x-axis here you have work from home status before the pandemic and then the transition rates into um, the, the different uh, work from home status and, and non-employed during the months. Um, if you look at sort of the, the rate at which people were transitioning into non-employment, it wasn't really different uh, depending on whether you were working from home before the pandemic or not. The probabilities initially of losing your or, or moving into non-employment uh, were the same across these work from home categories. And actually later on in the pandemic, you were marginally more likely to have transitioned into non-employment if you were doing, uh, if you were working from home before the pandemic. The, so it's not whether you were working from home that is connected with job loss during the pandemic. The, the link is all between your ability to work from home uh, and, 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 and job loss. Okay, so um, <clears throat> composition effects, meaning you know, how important is the fact that some workers changed jobs and went towards jobs in which they could work from home, turns out not to be very important. This is mainly a story about people who transitioned uh, in their pre-existing jobs. So let me give you two pieces of evidence for sort of our main claim that most of this was really a dramatic change in work arrangements. Uh, so one thing we did was simply ask all people who were still in the same job with the same employer, um, but who switched from commuting daily to working from home completely, so why didn't you work from home before? 
And then the overwhelming answer that we, we get is that, well, my employer didn't allow it. Okay, so the, the, those are the fractions in blue. So in red, our people, or there's a fraction of, of those workers that stated, well, I could have worked from home, but I prefer to commute to the job. So that's a much smaller fraction. And then the remainder is people that um, said that, well, my job couldn't be done from home. And so there, apart from possible measurement error, I think what we're capturing is basically people who the nature of, of, of the job changed, and that may include, uh, for instance, doctors where, you know, switched to telemedicine, which wasn't really uh, widely used uh, before the pandemic. The second piece of evidence uh, that sort of before, before even going to the structural model that this may have had a lot to do with sort of the change in work arrangement is in the second panel where we compare uh, payroll workers with self-employed. If you look a bit before the pandemic, the self-employed were way more likely to be working from home. Um, now, both categories saw an increase in working from home, uh, but the self-employed, you know, that returned basically to pre-pandemic levels uh, fairly quickly, uh, whereas the payroll workers, that went up, and it stayed up. Okay, and sort of you can do the different, what's the difference? Well, self-employed, if they wanted to work from home, you know, they're their own boss. So they, 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 they pretty much returned to what they were doing before, whereas for payroll workers, that's where you see the, the change, okay? Okay, so very quickly, so, so this is a very, very simple model. Um, there's not much bells and whistles. It's just trying to capture sort of the, the, the basic uh, decision to work from home or not. And because it's mainly about people who aren't in their, in their pre-pandemic jobs and used to commute, uh, we abstract from you know, people changing sectors and jobs and all that. It's just perfectly cemented labor markets, continuum of workers. You have this choice of working from home or, or commuting, and then a, 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 a monopsonistic firm who hires, uh, makes a decision to hire these workers. And so preferences are totally linear. The difference between working from home and working on site is that there is a, a cost chi, uh, a relative cost of, of working on site. Um, <clears throat> so labor is indivisible. And the only other difference between working on site and working from home is that we assume that the productivity of working on site is the same for everyone. But then there is a, a distribution of productivities of, of working from home. And so some people will be very productive at home. Some people will be uh, not so productive and are more productive uh, on site. And we just assume a, a, a very analytically convenient Pareto distribution. Um, and so the choice is very simple. You make a decision to work, and then you make a decision uh, whether to work from home or not. So as I said, there is a, a monopolistic and a monopsonistic firm that sets prices and wages. And then the key thing here is that we assume there is a fraction of firms that uh, simply is, is not uh, allowed to, uh, um, or that doesn't hire uh, people that are working from home. So it hires only commuters, okay? Um, you know, in, in this baseline version of the model, the supply of commuting workers is infinitely elastic, so the wages sort of pinned down by one plus the cost of working on site. And then there's a fraction theta of firms that's gonna hire a mix of workers. Um, and it's gonna pay uh, workers that are working from home at a discount relative to commuters because of the, 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 the monopsonistic power. So in essence, there is a benefit, I mean, for, for firms here, there is a benefit of hiring work from home workers because they get, can get away with uh, paying these workers a little bit less. Okay, so the substitution channel I was talking about earlier is basically the direct response to changes in CHI, this cost of working on site. And then uh, for a given theta, a given fraction of firms that uh, allow work from home, and then the work from home adoption channel is all about the fraction of employers basically that, that are allowed work from home. And the quantitative exercise that we're conducting here, and I don't have time to go into too much details, is to sort of trace out a time series for both of these objects. Um, and again, so we, we, we calibrate using data from the RPS. Uh, we calibrate um, sort of the, the, the work from home access before the pandemic, 
um, based on survey questions, and we use information on employment, and we target employment, work from home employment, and then the wages. And we do this at the industry level, given how different uh, all of this was for industry, we do this at the industry level and then we aggregate up. So here's the, the result of the model decomposition. So what is shown here is the work from home only share in, in the various months. And then the different colors represent the contributions of, of, of the, the different channels. And essentially, um, so demand shocks don't play a role here for, for work from home employment. Uh, but the key result here is that, um, um, according to this decomposition, most of the rise in work from home is really about the change in the thetas here, the change in the, in the, in the fraction of firms that is allowing, that is giving workers this, this option to work from home. And the red here is the contribution of the substitution channel, so the, the response, the direct response to the increase in the, in the health costs of be working on site. And it does matter, but it, it, it not as much as, as the adoption effect. Um, so just, this doesn't mean that the increase in costs of working on site didn't go up a lot. They did, and it mattered for other outcomes. For instance, here I'm showing uh, the role of changes in, in the level of demand, which is also something that we trace, uh, and, and the role of, of demand for explaining the, the decrease in employment versus the sort of the shift in labor supply, the increase in CHI. And it is clear that the, the sort of the, inc the, the, the adverse shift in labor supply matter a lot for employment, just not so much for the, the change in work from home. Okay, so then we use a model for this counterfactual. Let's, let's assume that the costs of working from home return to where they were, where we calibrated them before the pandemic. But let's keep the, the theta, the access to work from home, uh, as we measure it, as we find it, uh, sort of a, towards the end of our sample. Um, that's the exercise. And when you do that, uh, so we find that, the, so whereas 15% of workers had the option to be fully uh, uh, at home, before the pandemic, that increases to, that basically doubles to 31.4%. Not everybody who has the option chooses to work from home. It depends on whether you, you're better off or not, you're more productive or not. And so we, we find that uh, in practice, about half of those people who, who have the option would effectively also uh, exercise that option. So the work from home rate would double from 7.5% to 14.6%. Um, you know, we do a version of this model where we do it in terms of share of work days, and the, the message is very similar. So you'd have 50% of workers having the option to at least spend one work day a week uh, from home. And then 21.3% uh, of, of those workers would, would actually make use of, of that option according to our model. Okay, so validating these quantitative predictions, when I, what I'm showing here in the last column uh, is uh, some, some questions that we asked. So we asked, we asked workers, think a year ahead, um, what will you be doing? Will you be still fully remote some days? Um, and basically, whereas we predict that, you know, 14% of workers will be fully remote, the answers we got in our survey is that 12.1% of workers would still be expecting to work from home completely a year from now. And, and what you see here is that, you know, the expectations for workers were a little bit less for being fully remote and a little bit more for being 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 partially uh, remote. Um, again, the heterogeneity here is huge in these expectations. And again, here, you know, again, it's highly educated workers and, and so on and so forth. If you look at children here, having children is, you know, you're 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 uh, pretty low, uh, or you're less like, or you didn't expect to to be working from home. Okay, we also did a couple of follow-up surveys. I'm almost done. Um, so we did one in February 2022 and another one in June. And so um, our model was predicting 14%. That's actually the answer we got for both of these follow-up surveys. Um, and the workers themselves were forecasting 12%. To show you, it turned out it was 14%. And then we asked the uh, expectation question again in each of these surveys and you kind of start seeing that the answers we get were slightly below um, um, below 14 percent 
so 10% and 11%. So maybe we're seeing a little bit of a, of a drop off, at least in terms of expected work from home rates. Okay, so my time is up. So what is, what is the main message here? Um, so, you know, beyond the initial months of the pandemic, we believe this is, the pandemic has really caused a, a pretty dramatic and sudden change in uh, the, the access to, to work from home. And this access is very unequally distributed. It's heavily concentrated among a certain type of worker. Um, and so working from home, what that means is that uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's created new benefits for many workers, right? You save time on your commute. It has an impact on productivity, which I did not quantify here for, I think, for good reasons, uh, because we would be mostly making that up. But, but in the model, at least there is, a, uh, there is a, an effect on, 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 on productivity. But again, this is going to accrue to a particular share of the workforce. And, and vast majority of workers in the US, they simply do not have, have this, this option because of the nature of the jobs that they're in. And that's it. Thank you. So, um, when we think about things that have been uh, changing a lot uh, with COVID, obviously working uh, from home and the rise of working from home is one of them. And I guess we all have uh, the perception that the prevalence of working from home has increased a lot. But how much? Right? It's difficult to say. And, you know, uh, Richard told us uh, a few examples yesterday of things that we thought were one way, just from quick data that we got, and then turned out to, not to be that way, due to things like, you know, representatives of samples. And here, this is a particularly acute problem, because of course, if we ask people, say, with an internet survey, whether they're working from home, people who are going to reply are people who are in the computer, in front of the computer lots of the time, so they're going to be much more likely to work from home, right? So here, it's important to, you know, to do the sort of things that, that Carl has, has been telling us, in terms of doing something careful where we go back to you know things like the cps and some uh, something we can actually put weights and make sure that the numbers we are getting are actually representative right so, so that's that's something that that's important but not only do we want to know how much has working from home increased we also want to understand why and we want to understand why partly yes sort of you know understanding what's been going on but also because it's going to help us make better predictions for the future right because depending on what the reasons driving this, this change, whether it's purely, purely the health risk associated with the pandemic, or whether it's something more uh, systematic uh, that might be changing, then this uh, is going to give us different predictions. In particular, it's going to give us different predictions for how persistent there's going to be. Right? This is, again, another topic that was you know, present in our discussions yesterday was the extent to which uh, COVID-19 is going to have permanent versus uh, transitory effects, right? And we had some examples of shocks that, uh, you know, Paul was telling us yesterday about uh, global bio chains and arguing that there's so much uh, sunk cost in those that uh, a change that is temporary is going to actually not have permanent effects. But Richard was telling us other examples yesterday about things that might be permanent, like the loss of early work experience, the loss of some uh, educational investments, those are going to be very hard to make up for in the future, right? So it's actually very important to figure out in this context of working from home, the extent to which this shock is going to be temporary or permanent, right? So addressing all of these things is, I think, what, what Carl's paper is, is trying to do. And I think it's a very important task, right? So just, just for, for a quick summary, they start by having this online survey of uh, commuting or working from home uh, as a choice. And then they ask these questions about how many days did you work uh, and how many days did you commute in the previous week for a period that goes from May 2020 to June 2021. 
and they compute uh, working from home as the difference between the days that you worked and the days that you commuted. They also ask the same questions retrospectively for February 2020, so they can compare pre and during pandemic. And then if they were commuting in February 2020, then they also ask questions about what is the main reason with three possibilities. You know, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't work from home because my employer wouldn't allow it. Uh, because it was not possible for me, because, say, the job that I have, or because it was not my preferred arrangement. Then they use this to do a bunch of things. First, they document the evolution of working from home over that year for the data. And in particular, they show the persistence of this uh, working from home arrangements. Um, then they uh, develop a model with this commuting working home choice, and they use the model uh, and a survey uh, that they have to quantify the relative importance for persistence of, on the one hand, sustained health risk, which over this period was still significant, that would have made working from temporary preferable for workers, versus some exogenous change in employers that allow, in number of employers that allow working from home, uh, with the idea that that might have made, made feasible, working from home arrangements that were not previously allowed, and they use this to predict what's going to happen with working from home going forward, right? So first element of all of this is this very neat survey, uh, what they call the real-time population survey. So it's a, a national labor market survey of uh, working age adults over this period. They're working from a question starting May 2020. It goes all the way to June 2021, designed by, by themselves, fielded online by, by Qualtrics. It's also, as, as, as uh, Karen, uh, he already mentioned, it's, it's available for use by, by others. It's you know, one nice feature is that it's actually modeled over the, the CPS, so they have lots of questions coming with the CPS, which is nice because then you can use the CPS weights to get around this issue of representatives, right? And I think that's a very, very good design decision and something that makes this data very useful. At the same time, it doesn't just replicate the CPS, it has important advantages for measuring working for home relative to the CPAs. Uh, in particular, uh, in their data, they compute days that people work from home as the difference between days worked and days commuted. Whereas the CPS asks about days that you work from home because of the con coronavirus pandemic, right? So in terms of understanding, uh, looking at working from home overall, their measure allows you to look at all of the working from home, whereas the CPS only looks at uh, things that are really driven by, by the pandemic. Also, they ask the same questions retrospectively for February 2020, which means you see not only what's going on during the pandemic, but also can compare it with what was happening before. And then finally, uh, for people who did not work from home before, but they do afterwards, they ask why. And that's also going to give us some insight into not only what's driving this, but also some basis for making better predictions about the future, right? So overall, a very nice data set and, and very useful for what they do, but I think it will also be useful for, for others. Then to interpret this data and also to figure out what's uh, going to happen going forward, they, they develop a model, right? And the model, uh, you know, as, as he emphasized, it, 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 it's a simple model. It really tries to, to get at, at some core elements. So, of course, it, it necessarily has some simplifying assumptions. Uh, one of the simplifying assumptions is that firms and workers in the model are always aligned in the preferences over working from home. So if the workers prefer it, the firms prefer it too, right? Um, Second simplification is that firm policy is exogenous, so whereas the worker choice is endogenous. Um, um, and then if the firm allows for working from home arrangements, then the commute choice depends on this uh, health risk in the workplace uh, and also on the productivity of working from home, which is going to vary across people. So with the pandemic, uh, three, uh, three elements uh, that are uh, possibly changing. First, uh, health risk is rising in the workplace. Second, they uh, have an exogenous increase in the percentage of employers that allow working uh, from home. And third, they also have this productivity parameter of working from home, and they use that to exploit heterogeneity across, uh, across sectors, but there's really no, no change in their calibration in terms of the overall the, the level, right? So for a given person in a given occupation, the productivity of working from home does not change in the, in the calibration, right? So then they use this to quantify the relative importance of the health risk versus this exogenous increase in the percentage of employers that allow working from home. 
So they have two main channels through which we, have, we might have this persistence over the time of the survey in working from home. The first is what they call substitution, right? So under this scenario, the working from home would be, uh, the rise in working from home would be driven mainly by an increase in the health risk, plus the fact that now firms are uh, allowing working from home uh, more frequently. Then before the pandemic, under this scenario, working from home would have been worse than commuting for both firms and workers. Because remember, in the framework, they always agree. Then the percentage of uh, firms allowing working from home was low for exogenous reasons, but it was not binding because anyway, workers and, and firms didn't want to work from home uh, uh, in the majority. Then the pandemic makes the health risk rise and then makes working from home temporarily better than commuting for both firms and workers. And there's also an exogenous increase in the percentage of firms allowing working from home. Because now you have this health risk, people start to work from home. But then if this is the case, the prediction is that once the health risk falls, because workers and, uh, and firms both prefer not to work from home, we'd go back to the previous situation. This is not what they find is uh, supported uh, by the data uh, when seen through the lens of the model, right? So instead, the uh, mechanism that they, 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 they stress is a different one, where the rise in working from home is driven mostly by an exogenous increase in the percentage of firms that allow working from home. So in, under this scenario, before the pandemic, working from home was not worse for firms and workers, it was actually better. But for some reason, firms did not allow it. Now the health risk rises, and also uh, firms start allowing working from home because it was always better, and also this had the other health risk. Now people start commuting, uh, sort of working from home more often. And if that is the case, once the health risk goes away, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the, the percentage of firms, sorry, this is, uh, it's, it's wrong at the bottom, right? So, so what would happen in this case is you would go, uh, instead of going back, you would maintain this because, uh, uh, you know, it has always been better and now it's allowed, so you keep, you keep doing it, right? So then, you know, this, are, this is just, it, it's, it's, it's a simple model, but somehow it allows to uh, connect these two mechanisms to the questions in the survey. So here, if substitution dominates, then uh, most respondents uh, will say that they did not work uh, pre-pandemic because they preferred not to. And the answer implies, when seen through lens of models, that working from home was worse for workers, because in the model they're aligned with firms, that will also be worse for firms. And then the conclusion would be that working from home, uh, the rise in working from home was mainly driven by the health risk, uh, making uh, this arrangement temporarily better. If, uh, if adoption dominates instead, then most respondents will say they did not work from home before the pandemic because they were not allowed to. This implies that it was better for, for workers. And then, you know, if you think that this is, uh, these arrangements are not going to change, then they kept doing, kept doing this afterwards, right? So uh, given this piece of evidence that people were mainly saying they did not work from home before because they were not allowed to, and the complementary evidence that he mentioned on uh, uh, self-employed uh, versus uh, employees, uh, they conclude that it was mainly this uh, adoption by firms of working from home practices that has driven the, the change, and therefore that we're likely to see a prevalence of working from home afterwards that's going to be much higher than they used to be, right? So, so you know, it, it's, it, it's all neat, and of course when, when you do this kind of model, you, you need to make some simplifications, and it's, it's a nice way to, to look at it. In a way, you know, I, I would have liked to see, instead of three exogenous parameters here, I would have liked to see a single exogenous shock driving it. And I think, you know, in essence, it's not different from the story that Carol was telling us, but it, my, my interpretation is slightly different, right? So in their model, they have three exogenous parameters. One is about the health risk, which was low pre-pandemic, rises during the pandemic, and then falls post-pandemic. The second exogenous parameter is the percentage of firms that allow working from home, which was low pre-pandemic, rises through the pandemic and then remains unchanged post-pandemic. And the third uh, exogenous parameter is the productivity of working from home, which varies across people, but is unchanged throughout, right? So, uh, you know, I think one could reinterpret what they are showing us in terms of the data uh, through the same sequence of events, but based on a single health shock. 
And to do that, what you could have is a, a change in the productivity of working from home that is endogenous, but is driven by learning by using, right? So we have many technologies where how good we are at using the technology depends on how many people have been using it. So it's not that working from home was better for firms and they just made the wrong decision before and they didn't allow it. It's that maybe if they had all coordinated before, it would have been better. But because, you know, one alone couldn't make this big change, for a single firm, working from home practices were not really profitable before, right? So it's not firms that were making the, right, the wrong choice or an informed choice. They were making the right choice, given that no one else was using working from home uh, practices. Then the health risk makes it temporarily better, even if the technology is still not very good. Now you have this learning by using, where everyone starts using working from home. We develop this technology and we get used to using it much faster than we would have done otherwise. And now, endogenously, the productivity of working from home has become better and now it's actually you know, preferable for firms to keep this, this in practice, right? So essentially, it's the same sequence of events, but it's, it's a slight you know, representation of the model where instead of everything driven by, by three, uh, three parameters, we have one that is driving the whole, uh, the whole team, right? Um, so then, you know, other, you know, thinking a bit now outside the model, there, there are a couple of things that I, I think are also useful uh, thinking forward, and here it's not so much about the paper, it's really about thinking about this, this topic uh, more generally. One is about coordination and, and multiple equilibrium social norms, right? So in the model, the choice of working from home versus commuting depends only on the worker individually. But of course, how useful it is to go to the office depends on how many other people are going to the office. If no one else is going to the office, why am I going to go to the office, right? It's, it's useless, right? But if everyone else is going to the office, then it might be much better, right? So there's this whole coordination issue. And of course, this may be transitory, but it's actually difficult to, to, to get back into this again, right? And you know, we've seen it you know, uh, at Femsi. We've, we've always had this environment where everyone is always there. We interact a lot. And it's actually taking a few months to get back to that, right? So I think we're back to that now, but it's really taking a few months from where it was possible to really coordinating again on all going in, right? And I think it's also happening in, in other workplaces too, where it's going to, it might take time to coordinate again into this, this, this feature of, of, of being there. Second aspect that I think is important is, although, you know, of course, you know, the, the, the model is trying to keep things simple, so it's having firms and workers in agreement about whether working from home is better than commuting or not, there might be some disagreement. And if there's some disagreement, then, uh, you know, it's important how this choice is, is made, right? And, um, you know, in particular, uh, you know, this, 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 well, one is better than the other. Uh, the productivity of working from home versus working for uh, in the office might be different, not just across sectors, but even across tasks, right? So it might be some things that are easy to do at home and some things that are not, right? And when we see all of this early evidence about productivity changing or not changing with working from home, I think it's really too early to talk about these things, right? Because many, we, we know many of the things that really make us progress in terms of productivity or things like invention, like creativity, things that come, you know, spontaneously from interactions, right? So it may be that we are doing the things we we're already doing before as efficiently as we we're doing it before, even though we're working from home more often. But maybe this kind of long-term improvements, this, this big uh, jumps, we're missing more of that, right? So whether that's going to cost us in the long run or not, I think it's difficult to, to say so, so far. And then, you know, in terms of this potential disagreement between uh, workers and, and firms, then, it, it, you know, it also raises the question of how are these arrangements going to be set going forward, right? And especially this might create some important heterogeneity, right? Because there's the aspect that Carol already mentioned in terms of uh, self-employed versus employees. But also there's been a lot of emphasis in labor about, you know, monopsony power by firms, and that may also vary. But also the, the, the bargaining power of workers is going to depend a lot depending on whether you have a permanent contract, whether you have a temporary contract, whether you just got into the firm, whether you have some more casual arrangements, right? So this heterogeneity that we already see in terms of the level of education and, and income and the occupation may also be reinforced by the bargaining power of workers, where workers who have lower education and have jobs that are already less suitable for working from home may also be in, in, a, in a 
worst bargaining position to try to request their firms to have these working from home arrangements, right? So that may actually compound this heterogeneity that we all are already uh, seeing. Okay, and that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Diego. Let's gather a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, okay, uh, there and Paul. Um, so I was wondering whether your survey has questions on worker beliefs about job security if they work from home. So at least, and this might also affect it eventually the persistence of it because, at least anecdotally, it seems in the tech sector many workers were working from home. Um, and now there are layoffs and these same H-1B workers who were working from home are being rehired in India at lower costs. So, you know, you can say even if productivity is not changing, there's a cost issue. So I, I found the presentation discussion both very insightful. So I thank you for that. I had two reactions trying to, I, I think Diego was rightly putting this in terms of how persistent this is going to be. So there's two, two comments I have, one pointing towards perhaps persistence, and I didn't see that captured in your model, and I'm wondering, maybe it's because it's not important, is the fact that at least in the US, many people moved during the pandemic. So they moved from city centers to the suburbs, which completely changed the cost of working from home or not. So I gather you didn't ask that in the survey, but it, that, that's an important dimension, I think, if it's, if it's important in the data. And it might be more of a US thing than a, than a Europe thing. The other aspect is, you know, if I, you know from what I, what I hear from my wife, who's, who has an actual real job, uh, from, my, from what I hear, the, the model I would have had in mind would have been one, and I think you hinted this, Diego, in which there's a conflict between firms and workers, maybe a bargaining model, and this was a period with a very tight labor market. So I think firms would have loved to bring people back, but realized they couldn't um, because of it was hard to replace them. So uh, to me, that from what I hear, that's an important margin. Uh, maybe not in academia, but in, in in many sectors, and and that would obviously have implications for the persistence because if the labor market is to get less tight, we might see firms uh, pushing stronger for people to come back. Betty, yeah, okay. Very, very interesting presentation. So I was uh, wondering, you have um, data to test uh, what you say that basically there was a wage penalty for those who are working at, at home. So in the U.S. maybe it could happen everything, but here, if I, I think in this question here in Spain. Um, that would be something that probably could be illegal. No? Uh, and, and if anything, my experience is that it goes the other way around. Basically, we are paying in order to you know, compensate some cost of working at uh, home. Okay, thank you. Very nice paper. Uh, but as Diego said, this only gives the perspective of the worker. I think to have the full story, we have also we also need the perspective of the firm. And, 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 and in the perspective of the firm, apart from things that Diego already mentioned, uh, like uh, learning by doing, which I think is crucial to understand what happens, there is also the issue of the labor force composition in the firm. If the labor force is very homogeneous and all the occupations in the firms are suitable to work from home, then it's more likely that the firms move to working from home. But if you have a heterogeneous labor force with people doing different tasks, one suitable for working from home, another which are not, then maybe there is another conflict going on within the firm, apart from the bargaining power between the workers and firm. <coughs> Thank you. No, so my comment goes in the same direction. So I was thinking about, I know it is difficult to estimate the productivity of firm, uh, effect at the firm level, but there's something that is in the back uh, also with when th this discussion about the, the bargaining. And uh, I was wondering whether you have information, so there is a recent paper, I think it's by Nick Bloom that is doing now like a lot of work on this, on uh, 
productivity of uh, managers actually like uh, going down and complaining and not wanting like uh, like working from home because it's more difficult for them to manage teams. So maybe like along that direction of like different occupations within the firm uh, and, and like whether you are managing a team or not is going to make like a, a big difference and whether that if there is a way of, of quantifying a productivity effect, effect you know, because at the end it's, it's what's on, on the table for companies. So, Karel, you have, like, oh, okay, uh, Marco. Um. So, in terms of, of what may be permanent, I was thinking, so one thing I could see, simply comparing wor uh, work, uh, workers that already were working some way remotely, so the type of pay and contract that they have t seems to be uh, some way piecework, so they're paid for performance in, in terms of piece of quantity, how much they, they produce. So take delivery workers, they just, uh, they are paid for deliveries, not for the time it takes for them to deliver. So that could be something that is leading to experimental, you know, to experimenting new contracts. And so, I mean, I was wondering whether in your survey, when you ask people whether they worked at, at home and, and they changed their uh, type of employment, whether they have changed also the type of contract. So maybe the monitoring cost on the workplace may be different from those at home, etc. And the other thing is, is uh, I mean, you're highlighting the heterogeneity across workers with different skills and different tasks. So I was wondering whether also the sorting between firms and workers may change. Uh, uh, so underlying all this. Okay, so thank you very much for all the question and, and suggestions. I mean, I particularly appreciate suggestions because we are still running the survey, not every week anymore, every other week, but we're, we're adding questions. Uh, so on the moving, for instance, uh, we have three follow-up surveys. I only show two, but they include all the questions about the moving. And indeed, it's true. A lot of people moved, and it's, it, is, it is clearly correlated with, uh, with working from home. So it, definitely a lot of people moved because now they have the, this, this option. Okay, on the exogeneity of, of, um, of everything, of course everything is a function of the pandemic, there's no doubt. Um, and there, there, were there are various ways to microfound the decision to um, allow um, work from home. And so we, we felt, uh, so you know, you could go down that road, but, but there are many stories you can tell. There's a learning story, there could be simply just sunk costs of setting everything up from home. You have these complementarities. Um, we had really no idea which one of those to pick. You know, it could be different stories and, and different types of occupations. And uh, we also didn't clearly see an obvious way to identify the necessary parameters. But but I agree, this is this is something that you know requires more thinking. And I think you know, in, in future work, um, is worth addressing. Um, we okay. Uh, we we do not vary productivity. So productivity varies by sector, but we don't. We keep it deliberately constant over time. Again, we, there's no with the data that we had clear way of identifying productivity. So as I said, you you're basically making things up, in my opinion. Also, I don't think that uh, pro personally, I don't think uh, uh, there was any major shift in productivity of working from home. I mean, the technology to do everything was already there, and there might have been some some improvements, uh, but but we didn't see that as sort of the, the the first order thing. So we just chose to keep that constant. Um, okay, on, on the disagreement between workers and firms, I completely agree. Um, now. You know, when we wrote this paper, we also had, you know, at the Fed, we also run surveys uh, on firms, and we also asked firms about their expectations for work from homes, and it, they actually aligned very closely initially. I think it's only later when I think uh, firms figured out that maybe this work from home isn't really, uh, you know, all that great. And it, it creates all kind of problems, like, you know, particularly onboarding people and so on and so forth. And so that's really why it isn't in the model. And, and the model, ever, it, both workers and firms, they, they like it. But I think now, with what we know now, I think that that, that needs to be, um, I think, revisited a little bit yeah, as we learn. Um, beliefs about job security. No, we don't ask that. I think um, I, I definitely agree with, um, I mean, we, we talk to a lot of employers, and you, what you start seeing is in a lot of service jobs, okay, 
you know, I can hire someone uh, who lives anywhere in the U.S., but it doesn't necessarily need to be the U.S. And you, you do see certain jobs that are beginning, service sector jobs that are beginning to be uh, outsourced um, in ways that did not happen before. So I definitely, but we don't really ask, ask for that in our, in our survey. Um, what else? Yeah, on the wage penalty and whether it's legal or not, yeah, that, that's fair. We did run wage regressions, you know, um, and you're right. Wages actually, people that switch to working from home, so larger wage gains. Now, it's very difficult to give a causal interpretation to that because even if you throw in whatever controls you have, you know, there, you know, it's a different, it's probably a different type of job, right? Working from home, uh, you know, in ways that we may not be fully captured. Um, by education level and so on and so forth. So, but you're right, you know, um, um, wages did go up more for people that switched. Um, um, but we haven't really figured out a good way to identify the causal effect. Um, yeah, and on the legality, I think, you know, it's, it, and on the composition, uh, yeah, I, I, I do think it depends. You know, at, at the Fed, we have different departments and they each make their own decisions. And so some departments, everybody's, you know, the law department, most people are from home most of the time. In research, much less. And, and wages, I think, are also kind of set. So, so it, and if you're a firm and everybody does the same job, that's going to be very different. So, so I, I agree. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. <laughs>